so, so, so um, this webinar is organized through uh, the Q um, Health Foundation network. Uh, so Jane and I formed um, the Reimagining Health and Care Special Interest Group over, over 18 months, 24 months ago. Um, in response to a then what, what seems like a, a, a kind of emerging where, where it's now quite established way of thinking about how, how we run organizations differently and the impact that that can have on health and, and care and kind of re really rediscovering um, the, the human, human nature of, of work. Um, so uh, in the last, over the last few months, Jane has been leading on pulling these webinars together and, and, and this one's particularly um, <coughs> relevant um, because it's, it's absolutely bringing forward some of those key concepts of, around kind of human learning systems and, and, the, and, and, the, the, and the alternative to new public management. Um, so just to say if you are interested in, in seeing me again, um, Michael Little who is a um, uh, a social researcher and, and, and co-founder of uh, an outfit called Ratio. Um, he and I are, are going to be leading on the next webinar around Street to Scale, which is a, a trust-based um, form of funding for citizen action. So if you're interested in that, then, then please register um, on, on, the, on the website. And, and Jane has just posted um, the link into the, the chat, so, so use that to, to register. Um, so I'm not going to delay any more. Um, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Toby and Gary, uh, who are going to go through their thoughts and experience um, around the challenges of new public management and some of the some of the thoughts around what the, the alternative is. So over to you, Toby. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for joining in today. Um, Gary and I are going to talk about this, this, this issue of that, that we know new public management fails and particularly fails in complex environments, but what else can we do? And so the, the things we're going to cover, uh, um, we're going to uh, just I'm going to talk through very quickly uh, an overview of the, of the human learning systems approach as an alternative approach to public management. And within that, I'm going to just do a very quick refresher for people on what public management is and why we think complexity uh, uh, is an issue. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the human learning systems approach to public management. And then um, uh, I'm going to do something a bit, I'm going to do something a bit different than the presentations I normally give because people must be very bored of me doing the uh, presentation about the basics of human learning systems. So I thought I would talk a bit more about the process change which brings about the paradigm shift and how um, we've seen organisations go about uh, instituting this new way of working. Uh, so that you'll get 20 minutes from me on that and then uh, I'll, hand over, I'll hand over to Gary to talk about the kind of human learning systems as an alternative public management approach in practice and he'll talk you through some of the details of how that's worked in Plymouth. Um, so start of just to make sure that um, uh, we all have a kind of decent understanding of, of, of what it is that we're talking about when we talk about public management. Uh, essentially, public management is the discipline for how government plans and organises its work. This is sometimes called public administration. It doesn't seem to be a particular rhyme or reason about people calling it public management or public administration, but they're essentially talking about the same thing. And a, another way to describe it is, is, is to think about how public service and any form of social, social intervention is kind of planned, funded and managed. And there is a dominant way of doing the public management uh, that has been dominant for the last 30 years or so. And so it, this approach uh, uh, has a name, it's called New Public Management, and it's most uh, readily characterised as the three M's, markets, managers and metrics. And I'll just kind of go through each of those in reverse order to, so we've got an understanding of that. Uh, metrics is basically saying that um, the public service objectives must be measurable. So we must translate what we're trying to achieve in public service into measurable objectives and find ways to measure those. Then managers, essentially uh, this way of 
uh, working demands the creation of a class of workers, managers, whose job it is to, is to test whether those desired objectives are being achieved or not. So to monitor the, the metrics that are, uh, uh, that are being used. And finally, markets, which uh, is essentially an assertion that the best way to achieve value for money in meeting these objectives is to get firms to compete to deliver against the, the required metric data. So that, I mean, it's a, it's a deftly quick characterization of how the kind of dominant way of doing public management right now. But hopefully most of us would recognize that this is the way that things are done right now. Um, the only trouble is that we know that new public management doesn't work in complex environments. There is an absolute ton of research evidence to, that basically shows that it creates gaming, it creates perverse incentives, and it essentially makes the job of public service harder, not easier. And we've known this for a while. So, uh, so, Peter, so for example, Sir Peter Houston, uh, who was uh, ex-head of the civil service in Scotland, wrote a pamphlet in 2016, which described the unconscionably long death of new public management. Basically saying, we know this stuff doesn't work, why haven't we produced an alternative yet? So this, is, this is, leads us to the question, um, so what else can we do? And we think the start of that, uh, answering the question, what else can we do, comes from embracing the complexity of the real world. Because essentially it's our understanding that new public management fails because it pretends that the world is simple and linear when actually the world is complex. And so whatever we do in public management terms next has to start by embracing the complexity of the real world. And why do we think complexity is relevant? It's, our, our assertion is that complexity is relevant because it describes the fundamental processes by which the outcomes we care about are made. So we know that public service is concerned with producing outcomes in the world. And so we're saying if we fail to understand and embrace complexity, we won't be able to create the outcomes that we seek. And kind of very quickly skipping over what I normally spend about kind of five or 10 minutes ex explaining, um, what does complexity require of us? It requires the capacity to respond to variety because in a complex environment, each person's strengths and needs are different. So if we're looking to create outcomes for each and every person, we need to understand the variety that each and every person brings. It requires the, abil the ability to adapt to change because um, uh, the context in which social interventions, public service are undertaken is constantly changing. So the nature of those of that public service, those interventions needs to constantly change because that will affect whether they work or not. And finally, if we're looking to create outcomes, it requires an ability for us to shape systems whose behavior can't be reliably predicted and which no one controls. Because as we know, one of the fundamental uh, properties of complex systems is non-linearity non and emergence and once systems are emergent they cannot be reliably predicted. So that's what complexity requires of us. That's the kind of background to us developing this human learning systems approach and essentially what we've done is work with different public and voluntary sector organizations over the past kind of four or five years to try and understand what an alternative approach to public management looks like that starts by a recognition that the world is complex. Um, and uh, as you can see from this slide, just this week, we've launched a new website, www.humanlearning.systems, that brings together all our current knowledge about this as an alternative practice. Um, so on there, you'll find theory and methods and case study examples in practice. And also we're looking for, for new case studies all the time. So do check that out and get in touch if, you've, uh, if you would like to share any element of your practice. So very quickly, I'm now just going to rehearse some of the key elements of uh, human learning systems, uh, just to give people a basic grounding. Um, but then I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about a bit more about how this approach gets adopted. So human learning systems represents a shift in three key areas. So this, the shift that's characterized by the human element is a shift in service purpose. So it's saying that the purpose of public service is to meet human strengths and needs. 
The learning element is characterized by a shift in management focus. It's saying that the purpose of management in public service is to create the, condi the conditions for learning and adaptation, not for performance management, because our traditional forms of performance management are essentially pointless and counterproductive in complex environments. And so the way that performance improvement actually happens in, um, in complex environments is through uh, learning and adaptation. And so the purpose of management is to create the conditions where that is possible. And finally, leadership. There's a change in leadership focus in that uh, we understand that the positive outcomes we seek are emergent properties of complex systems. So healthy systems create better outcomes. So the purpose of leadership focus is to create healthy systems. So those are the kind of three key shifts that human learning systems describes as a kind of paradigm shift in public management. Um, I'll, do, I'll very quickly dig into each of those ideas now. So the human element, essentially, the, this is the uh, key thing about responding to variety. So to be human means putting on your vest. That's what we've seen from the organisations working in this way. So they, organisations working in this way have a service focus which responds to the variety of human need. So it, it creates bespoke responses for each and every person for whom positive outcomes are needed because each and every person's route to a positive outcome and each and every person's version of a positive outcome is different. And if we're going to understand variety, we need empathy. So we, to, put, to understand the life of others requires really strong empathic skills. And we start by viewing people as whole human beings. So viewing people from a strengths based perspective, because um, uh, we, uh, a human perspective doesn't see people as a set of problems to treat. It sees people as rounded human beings. And finally, a human perspective trusts people with decision making, because the only way that we can respond to the variety of human uh, strength and need is by devolving decision making about what happens into the work. So the only people with enough knowledge to, cr to craft an appropriate public service response are the person being served themselves and a worker who has a strong enough relationship with them to really understand their lives. Only those people have enough knowledge to make a decision about what kind of service and what type of intervention that should happen in people's lives. So human learning um, essentially, as I was saying, the human learning systems approach says that the focus of management in a, a complex environment is learning. Um, and this is not necessary because in a complex environment, there's no such thing as a, a stable version of what works at a programmatic level. Because in a complex environment, the activities that we undertake through public service are always um, uh, uh, working amidst a dynamic, constantly changing context. So the nature of what works is constantly changing because of its relationship with this dynamic context. So this means that the moment that we stop learning is the moment our interventions stop working. So what actually what works in a public service environment when it is complex is the continuous process of learning and adaptation. So this, re this requires a really, really significant change on the a part of funders, commissioners, managers, because essentially, it, rather than purchasing evidence-based services that work, what funders and commissioners who are working in this way do is purchase the capacity for organisations to learn and adapt, because that's what works. Uh, we know that learning is enabled by funding for learning, not results creating a learning culture and significant aspects of that are removing competition and creating an environment where people can talk about mistakes and uncertainties together, this idea of a positive error culture. And finally, and it's really significantly, using data to learn. So ensuring that our measurement processes are focused on learning rather than kind of spurious notions of accountability. Human learning, finally systems. Um, uh, essentially, the hypothesis here is that healthy systems produce better outcomes. So what we're um, uh, pe people who work in this way are saying that the, uh, the purpose of leadership, and this is a distributed leadership idea, so it's not just about kind of seniority, is um, to nurture healthy systems. So systems in which 
the actors in that system are able to coordinate and collaborate their activity effectively. And we call this role of nurturing healthy systems, system stewardship. And that contains kind of significant, or that the human learning systems approach therefore contains significant implications for how public management is done. Firstly, it's public management without targets. And it's without targets because the use of targets um, prevents flexible bespoke responses and they make the work less efficient. It's kind of, the evidence is really actually very clear on this. In complex environments, targets make things more expensive and more difficult. So we don't use them. Secondly, the implication is it is the job of managers and leaders to build trust. You cannot assume it, so you need to put active work into developing relationships. This is your job. Thirdly, people need to learn together, to co-produce work together, to experiment together, to talk about what didn't work together. Fourthly, everyone's voice is important. To make a system work, all the actors in the system need to have their voice heard. So we, we, are, we have come in public service and public management to understand the importance of hearing kind of the voice of citizens and service users and co-production and co-design, all that. That is very important. But those aren't the only voices that we need to hear. We need to make sure that everyone's voice in the system is heard. And finally, it requires us to build new forms of accountability and responsibility. So it requires us to develop forms of mutual accountability and that personal sense of responsibility for work, because essentially the human learning systems approach is built and the complexity requires nurturing the intrinsic motivation of people doing the work and their personal responsibility for, uh, 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 for doing the right thing. So those are some of the key implications. And what we're talking about here essentially is paradigm shift in, in how we do public management. And the, the adoption of the human learning systems approach is, a, uh, is an example of paradigm shift. So it's not just a different set of practices or tools. It's a move from a control mindset to an enablement mindset. And the, as I was saying, this is about finding and nurturing intrinsic motivation and creating a system in which, which, uh, in which intrinsic motivation is the assumption and the norm by which things work. So key question, how do people implement this approach? And we've been able to, through, through engaging with and uh, putting research alongside the organizations who are working this way and have developed this approach, we've been able to see a little bit about what this as a change process looks like. And so I'll take people through this change process very quickly now. So it starts with this idea of identifying purpose for a system, because identifying a purpose for a system allows us to make a rough and ready sense of who's in and who's out, what the boundaries of that system are. So, for example, uh, in Plymouth, they asked the question, uh, they thought the purpose of the system was to support uh, vulnerable adults um, to lead, lead the lives that they would want to live. And so uh, if, you, if that's the purpose of the system, then you can very quickly produce a list of organizations that you think are involved with that. And then that process, th then the process moves to understanding the system. So making that system visible to the actors within it. Asking questions like, what's the state of the relationships between those uh, actors? Do they communicate? If so, how? Do they trust one another? And undertaking a deliberate and purposeful process to build relationships and trust between them. And in doing that, in building relationships and trust, one of the key conversations is to turn that de facto purpose that enabled a boundary to be built around the system into an, a shared and agreed purpose amongst those set of actors. So, and when that work is done, you have an under, the system understands itself as a system. That allows people to move into a co-design phase, like ask, essentially ask the question, okay, we understand ourselves as a system, what work are we going to do, are we going to do together? And there, there are various processes by which people uh, undertake co-design and they shift from, okay, we understand that it is necessary for us to collaborate to what is it that we should collaborate on? What is it we should do together? And the, um, the, one of the crucial things about that as a co-design process is that 
it doesn't produce hard and fast programs of action that people know are right. What it produces is a series of experiments that people try. So the out of the co-design post comes a whole set of experiments and explorations. Let's try this, let's try that, let's try that, that are themselves uh, um, learning loops. And it's really, really crucial to think about these as genuine learning because the, an experiment is only an experiment if you wrap proper learning processes around it. And so all of those uh, experiments that people try um, with different types of service, with different types of uh, people meeting, with hearing people's voices in different way, all of those produce new knowledge about how the system works that needs to be spread back into the system through processes of embedding and influencing. Essentially, these are collective sense-making processes where people can understand what, what was happening through those processes of experimentation. And that it's really important that there is that that those are collective sense making processes. I was on a call the other day with some healthcare improvement Scotland people who we came up with a beautiful phrase, no sense making about me without me. And finally, so and that this that process as a cycle operates because at its heart, it has an idea of governance as learning. So a set of people who are driving the uh, around the circle by, a, by asking a, a set of learning questions. Is what's happening what we intended? And from that question, what should we do next? And constantly asking the question, who are we to be making these reflections and decisions? And if, it ha if, a, if the uh, cycle has this kind of governance as learning at its heart, that is what drives around the circle and keeps the circle going and then because uh, and it keeps the circle going continuously rather than pausing and thinking excellent our work here is done because this is a continuous cycle of change and improvement and adaptation so how can you bring about this change what is it that you can do um, some of the things that we've learned essentially come down to the idea of experiment 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 Where's the energy to try something different in your context? Who has experienced the failure of new public management is, and is willing to try something different? Second kind of key question, what's the size of experiment that you can create permission for? And we, people were saying it needs to be enough of a, it needs to be big enough to be meaningful, but small enough for it to be okay when things go wrong, because things will go wrong because it's a complex environment and people are trying something new. Uh, thirdly, be rigorous. So when you're framing experiments, frame learning processes. Ask and answer the question, how will you learn? And finally, I think one of the most crucial aspects of this is in, in, in making this paradigm shift, don't waste a single second of energy on the skeptics because you cannot talk someone into paradigm shift. You cannot provide evidence that demonstrates that one is better than the other because the nature of paradigms is that people ask different questions and interrogate evidence differently. Don't waste energy on the skeptics. It's kind of pointless. Essentially, build a coalition of the willing and do stuff. Experiment. Thanks very much. I'll now hand over to Gary. I'm going to jump in. Cool. Um, <clears throat> virtually. Um, I forgot to ask people, uh, if, if everyone could kind of do a quick intro to themselves, um, it'd be nice to see where everybody's coming from. So can you do that in the chat? Um, and also to remind people to post questions that you would like Toby and Gary to respond to at the end, um, which I will curate um, for you. Okay, I'll shut up. Over to you, Gary. Uh, okay, thanks. So Toby's going to be my uh, unglamorous assistant. Um, uh, so before we start, um, just to say that we use this approach in a number of systems, it's just that the Alliance is the most developed of those. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide, Toby? Uh, just uh, a couple of acknowledgement, acknowledgements. We did a lot of systems leadership work and we used the Leadership Centre to do that. And also Linda Hutchinson was the person that introduced us to the Alliance contract, and I'm using uh, actually three of her slides uh, around Alliance contracts. Next slide, Toby. 
So a bit about the background. So Plymouth's an integrated uh, commissioning team. So all of the CCG, the public health grant and the council's money has been uh, amalgamated into a single heap. So no one has any private budgets. It's a completely integrated budget and we're all integrated as uh, as colleagues on one floor of the same building so we all sit next to each other and uh, and do stuff together next slide Toby um, and an alliance really I just, I'm, it's important not to get hung up on the on the contract so we used an alliance contract in this example but we wouldn't necessarily use it in others it was about uh, picking the right vehicle for the right um, for the right issues but essentially an alliance is like a legal partnership agreement uh, within which participants retain their own ident identity and internal controls but essentially they pool aspects of their sovereignty a little bit like the EU um, uh, which is probably not a popular <laughs> analogy at the moment next slide Toby so if you just keep clicking through until you've got all that's it and another one that's it so that one um, so a traditional contract looks a bit like that uh, in fact, it would probably there would probably be more commissioners involved in that, and the alliance looks like this. So, so the alliance leadership team. Uh, so the Plymouth Alliance has got a total of twenty seven services in it. The leadership team, the people who actually sign the contract, are seven services uh, and three commissioners, and we operate on a. So all the money is devolved into that partnership, seven point seven million a year. The alliance is free to spend it in any way they choose. Uh, and each person in the Alliance leadership team, the 10 people, has one vote, and decisions are taken on the basis of unanimity. So it is possible and, and frequently happens that commissioners are outvoted by providers. Um, and so even within the Alliance team, it's about building uh, relationships with each other and kind of coalitions uh, around issues. And then there's an external person that we call the owning commissioner, um, and they are much more about facilitation rather than uh, an unblocking stuff rather than um, performance management in a traditional sense next slide Toby. so the the key thing about the alliance are, are, are the principles uh, and these are these these are the principles and um because we're going to share the slides i won't read them aloud to you because you'll be able to get them afterwards so if you want to go on toby so uh, I like because Toby's gone a bit off piece and a bit different. I've tried to kind of uh, shape my presentation along the same lines as his. So if you next click, um, so the complex needs example. Uh, so our process started in 2012 with, with a lot a failed lottery bid, but and essentially we did a huge uh, amount of co-production iteratively over four or five months, uh, and then we were unsuccessful with the bid. Uh, which has actually proved to be a blessing. Um, but everybody felt that we'd done so much work and we'd learned so much that we had to continue to try to deliver the things we'd submitted in the bid. Um, uh, and one of the principles of human learning systems, which Toby's already mentioned, is ideas of co-production and iterative checking back with people. Um, so on a number of subsequent uh, occasions, actually a more recent one was 2018, we, we go back to to, to our people and, and do kind of mass co-production events. Next slide, Toby. So the kind of findings um, essentially were that commissioning was seen as a master servant, top down, opaque and disempowering process that was carried out in silos, really near horizons. And essentially commission, commissioning was a problem setter, not least because it was, um, it was setting some of the metrics that Toby's alluded to. Next slide, Toby. Uh, similarly, services, even services that would traditionally see themselves as really um, what they would call service user focused, found that the feedback they got wasn't quite what they imagined it would be. So that service users uh, reported they often felt people did things to them rather than worked with them. Uh, and that wasn't a kind of an asset based thing. We also found and we continue, you know, in most systems we find there is this fundamental mismatch between what workers value about the work and what consumers value. So what workers value are their specialisms and expertise and what uh, customers repeatedly tell us is what they value are relationships, authenticity, warmth, stickability, those, those kinds of things. Uh, there was an assumption or certainly in commissioning that most uh, 
most services all kind of got along and they all uh, they all knew what each other did and and we repeatedly find that's absolutely untrue and and why would it be true if you're running competitive markets where you might lose contracts to each other and and that we found that labels and thresholds essentially have become barriers to access rather than enablers and that those thresholds and labels are often driven by targets so if you're only going to get paid if you deliver x number of uh, successful completions then you'll only take people that are likely to become a successful completion next slide Toby. so the first kind of phase is uh, understanding the system next slide uh, and our starting question uh, in 2014, 15 was uh, this, in an ideal world and within available resources, what would the system for people with complex needs look like uh, and how would we know? Next slide. So the way we tackled this, uh, and we tackled it over about a six or seven month period as part of the system leadership work we were doing with the Leadership Centre, is basically um, to try and find a, a multitude of ways of, of, of talking to each other and talking to people that use the system. So workshops, which were really about developing ideas and tools to test those ideas, but also was about making time to plan. Uh, so very early on, people would say, well, you know, I, I have a day job. Uh, but by the time we were into this, people were recognizing this actually was their day job. Um, and then kind of a process of field work, which was about um, exploring some of those ideas in depth, gathering new information, testing other ideas, uh, learning labs, uh, uh, the co-productions I've already mentioned. And in, uh, so these were about kind of trying to understand the system, but we by and large picked methods which would also build empathy, insight and understanding between the actors that were going out and gathering this information. So the way we used the appreciative inquiry was in by pairing disparate people so that they both did this thing called witnessing, what we call witnessing together, uh, because that helps develop a common understanding. It also later on in a system helps you to unstick things. If you've both heard a service user tell you that thing that the worker loves to do is a really bad thing, uh, at some, some point you'll want them to stop. And uh, if you both witness the person telling you that, it's much easier to get people to, to give things up. Next slide, Toby. So kind of breaking this down into steps, so we kind of would call this the exploration phase. It's really important to share why we are where we are. Uh, so there is a kind of an element of truth and reconciliation where services want to tell commissioners how, how terrible they've been. Uh, and commissioners may also want to tell the services some stuff too. Uh, but it's also about sharing values. Um, so one of the things about new public management to, to remember is that when it was introduced, it was introduced because everybody thought it was a good thing and it, it would be a, a better experience for people and services. People weren't doing it because they, they wanted to, 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 uh, to do harm. So it's really important for everybody to understand that, that what we were trying to create was a sense of a shared endeavor and that we recognize that whilst we might have differences about how to do things, we all basically wanted to do the same thing. Then we kind of, uh, we did nine months of uh, system leadership uh, training for everybody in the system. So uh, at that point, that was about 30 services. Um, so that was about identifying the value we wanted to add to the system. So understand the system. And then you can, once you do that, you can see all these missed opportunities you have, which are kind of crowded out by current practices. Um, something which has really come to the fore during COVID-19 when all those things have been swept away. Uh, creating empathy maps, so, so I cannot stress enough the importance of building empathy across the system, trying to understand what it's like to be in someone else's shoes, but in particular building understanding of life in a complex system. And I mean that for everybody, so, so, so one of our reflections is the system wasn't working for anybody, anybody that worked in it, anybody that commissioned it, or anybody that was uh, forced to, to derive services from it. And then you go through a kind of process of refining down, agreeing wh wh where your focus inquiries are going to be, planning that work, um, witnessing, as I've described, uh, sharing fieldwork stories. The way we do that is, uh, so we do lots of appreciative inquiry. We then write those up into the first person and read them aloud in groups, because we feel if, if something is, a story is told in the first person, 
it's much more likely to create empathy in the reader and the listeners. Next slide, Toby. Um, yeah, so the kind of continuation of that was, it's this really kind of iteration of the same thing, reframing the inquiry uh, questions from the person's perspective. So you do a round of inquiry, you read them aloud, uh, and then you might reframe uh, more questions because of what you've heard people tell you. Uh, and then you do that again, and then you go through this process of, uh, like I say, kind of synthesizing the learning, and you basically repeat until you have a rounded everybody feels you have a rounding, rounded understanding of the system. Next. Uh, uh, so the, the other thing which is on Toby's, or actually Toby and the Collaborate uh, Cycles is agreeing what we want to achieve. Next slide. Uh, so what I would say about this is there is no magic to this. It is relentless iterative discussion. It is relentlessly referring back to what you've learned it's about engaging decision makers that you're going to need to give you permissions or to stop doing things. Uh, and the way we engage those is by sharing stories with them. It's really important to identify the cultural differences that need work. Paradigm shift is largely a cultural problem, not a, not a structural problem. Um, this continuously checking back with each other about how we are, where we're going, is everyone happy, that kind of thing. Uh, and also this process of uh, if you if you meet a bump in the road, then try and identify some rapid experiments to test out the various ways you might overcome that bump in the road. Next slide, Toby. Uh, and so you move into this experimentation phase. So, so what I would say, it's not really a phase. So we've been experimenting continuously since 2015. We've never stopped. Uh, and actually under COVID, we're, we've ramped up the experiments. It's really, it becomes a constant thing. And some things about that are uh, good ideas are not an artifact of hierarchy. Anyone can have a good idea. And, and some of our best ideas have come from the people with the lowest status in systems. Um, and this idea that we try to create a culture of, of trying stuff and encouraging anybody and everybody to try stuff and it becomes infectious um, and you suddenly find there's all these experiments running and you know you may be a, one of the leadership team and you don't necessarily have any idea what experiments are going on uh, and that's okay because we we've done all this work understanding why we do stuff and we have a lot of kind of mutual trust uh, in order to encourage this to be easy, we have minimal governance. So the two things, which is really interesting to me that Mark Adam Smith in Gateshead has the same cri two criteria, I think, is, is this legal and is it safe? And if the answer to both those questions is yes, then you do not need to seek further permission. Regardless of your hierarchical status, you can try something. And, and so that might be two workers from do two different services in the Alliance agreeing they are going to work together in a different way. It may be a different venue. It may be using a different tool or technique. Um, and and they have permission to do that um, without seeking. You know, there's no, it's not these kind of endless processes and protocols to go through. As Toby said, it's pointless experimenting unless you're going to gather the learning. Uh, and we don't really make any distinction between good and bad learning. Learning is learning. Um, and so we, we have processes for doing that. Up, I mean, lots of us continuously keep keep learning logs. Uh, personally, I have a little notebook which I write stuff in, and other people do it on their phones. Or, um, and it's important that you have that with you all the time because these kind of lessons can happen at any time. And if you don't write them down, you, you forget them. So once all the learning is gathered, we would then repeat it with the new learning. Or if we feel that's not going to have any utility, we would try something else. And then we embed what's worked well on the understanding that that, that, mean, that may well need to change if learning or circumstances change. It refers back to the Toby's point that um, complex adaptive systems are unpredictable and what good looks like is constantly changing in the light of how the system is flexing. And really the kind of key thing about this is it's about introducing thoughtfulness into a system uh, rather than the routinized practice that we were seeing in systems before we started doing this. Next slide, Toby. Um, so a kind of word about culture, almost all the issues we encounter are cultural rather than structural. And so we're really careful only to invent new structures that support culture change and learning loops. So we have two key structures, one which is a, called the system optimization group, which you, if you like is a fairly high level group. 
made up of the, um, all the Alliance services and other services that are not part of the Alliance, but with whom we have defined offers and asks in our contract. And the role of that is that group is to solve big system problems that are to do with the interfaces of several systems coming together. And the other, the other uh, group we have is the Creative Solutions Forum, which is a practice forum, which is about solving really, really tricky cases. And we kind of draw out the system lessons from an individual case. So if, if you know, it, what you find in about half of cases is if the system is different, this wouldn't have been a problem. And then that's then fed into the system group. Um, uh, we try to do lots of things as a collective because that's it's all about building new culture together. Um, uh, we're constantly trying to build empathy. Um, and the other thing we do is to try and reframe things so that they are they are expressed positively rather than negatively. So historically, we might have talked about resistance from services, but but we wouldn't do that. We would we would recognise that that people are highly affiliated to their services or or their issues, and, and our role as a leadership team is to try to build new and bigger affiliations. And the way you do that is by engaging people in the experiments and prototypes and co-designs and and the integrated delivery. And really, just to echo something that Mark Smith says in Gates said that. Essentially, we discovered this too. You don't need new public servants, uh, but you do need new public services. The, the, the people we have that are working in systems uh, are generally kind of intrinsically motivated. They're really committed to their issues. Uh, and quite a lot of what we were doing previously stopped them giving their best. Next slide, Toby. Just some kind of interesting stuff. So we do still collect data on mandatory targets, they're mandatory, um, but we treat them as aids to learning. So, so, so we don't manage them uh, it, like we used to. We are constantly wrestling with metrics. Uh, what we're interested in is metrics that tell us about how the system is functioning. So quite a lot of that is kind of management information about what, where your flows are, where the demand is. Um, but it's also about relational stuff. So we do kind of uh, temperature checks, talk to people, who's not getting along, is one service resentful about another, that kind of thing. Um, and we're also struggling to uh, come to a position about how we understand what success is in, in, in an asset-based system. And that's, so we have a number of things running at the moment um, to try and see how they work really. Um, and our focus, which has really ramped up since COVID, is, is, is what actually matters to people. Because what our learning has shown us is that all the things that new public management metrics worry about get better if you ignore them, but actually try and do something early and bespoke for people, particularly people that, that have lifelong conditions for which there's no cure. Uh, it's about helping them live the best life they can uh, and you really can only do that in partnership with the person um, so they're kind of the 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 other thing is the kind of accountability uh, chestnut so we would talk about assurance mechanisms rather than accounting mechanisms uh, I mean it's a fairly uh, hair splitting difference but I mean, accounts, calling something accounting plays into kind of ideas of um, hierarchy and, uh, and ideas of, of of literally counting things. Whereas we kind of develop more relational forms of assurance. So for example, if a commissioner uh, spends a week in a service and is free to roam in any part of that service and look at any of the books of that service, they will have more assurance about what that service can and can't do than they would ever get in, in four quarterly performance management meetings a year. Another kind of thing which is worth bearing in mind is once you start to do this, you reach a point really quite soon where it's very hard to communicate with a new public management um, kind of uh, zealots or apostles or whatever you might want to call them um, because we don't have any familiar landmarks for them. So quite a lot of the things that, that are valued by new public management are not valued for, by us. And quite a lot of the things that we value are not yet valued by um, by new public management and the way we've overcome that is by inviting people to uh, to come and look to come and spend time to be really transparent uh, and to be really uh, open to to other people uh, is there another slide no thank you that's great thank you both to Gary and Toby um,
So I've been watching the chat and some really lovely positive comments um, and and engaging going on via via chat as as um, as the presentations have been going on. Um, so I'm gonna I, I've been I've been copying the questions um, out from the the chat as they've gone along. Um, if questions occur to you as we kind of go through um, the the next bit, then then keep posting them in there. Um, so, so, so I think picking out a bit of a theme, but also a question that was posed before the, the webinar started was, is around how do we do this um, within, within a new public management um, setting? So, so how, how, how do you carve out that space um, and how much space do you, do you need? Do you want me to have the first crack at that or you, Toby? You go, you go, guy. Uh, so for us, um, uh, we just, uh, because we were an integrated uh, um, health and social care commissioning team and um, we were kind of co-located with the CCG and at the same time we were a cooperative council under the political leadership, they were, as an organisation, we were explicitly looking at maybe we needed to do things differently and what the alliance offered was um, an experiment that was big enough to prove a point but but not so big that if it failed it would break the bank so that really kind of enabled us uh, way back in 2014 to to start on this journey and then of course as the alliance progressed and started to be successful it, even in new public management terms it was saving hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. Um, that then opens the possibility for more experiments in other areas of work. Um, and the interesting thing for us is the politics of that. So we began under a Labour Council, we were then a Tory Council, we were then a Tory UKIP coalition, and then we were back to Labour. But under all the politicians, we were allowed to continue because they all recognised that it seemed to be, we seemed to be on to something. So, Really, it was just about, uh, yeah, pe pe people's appetite to do something different. What, you know, it was a kind of peak austerity at the time uh, uh, and the past was no longer possible. We, it was unaffordable. So that really opened the space up for us to experiment. Over to you, Toby. Yeah, so the, in some respects, when people try this out, they're bound to be trying to construct a space for human learning systems within a broader new public man management environment because that's, that's the water that everyone starts to swim in, right? Um, and so creating a space for experimentation is th the way that people have um, found space to do, to, to try something different. And that, and it, as I was saying in my presentation, it's kind of, it's about what size of it, what size of space for experimentation can you and your influence and the, all the people who you can co uh, bring together into a coalition of the willing, amongst all of those people, what big, what size of uh, uh, area of experimentation can you carve out? What can you get permission for? I mean, it's really, re it seems to be really important for people to have some senior cover about that space for exp that space for exper experimentation, because at some point people, someone who will get disadvantaged by a new way of doing things and will complain to the boss. And unless the boss is bought in at that point, that complaint can get escalated and it, it can be a way of killing it, right? So you need a person at the top who will, is prepared to um, back it even when it gets difficult. Great, thank you. Just, so uh, Gary, just picking up on the, um, the political dimension and uh, and and uh, yeah and, and how that relates within a, a local authority can you just go in a little bit more detail about that uh, yeah so um, because the Labour administration at the time made us a cooperative party they kind of retained an interest uh, across the whole period even where they weren't in power and to be fair so did so did the the conservative portfolio holder she was she was also kind of really very interested but we the interesting thing for us is we have a kind of a couple of particular sponsors um, particular politicians the current portfolio um, holder um, it was very interesting for us earlier in the year 
we went to scrutiny uh, panel uh, and um, the councillor um, really gave an overview that was at a level of detail you would have expected from someone who was actually working in the Alliance. And the reason for that is he, uh, our invitation has spent a lot of time with us, uh, our co-production events and, and in our services. And um, uh, we were told at the beginning, one of the uh, problems we would have is that um, politicians like rag ratings, they like, and they like graphs. Um, and that actually, that's the opposite of what we found. So, so what we actually find is politicians are really good at understanding human stories because that's what they do every evening when they door knock and canvas. Um, and um, it's really not been a problem at all. And um, the scrutiny uh, panels <laughs> rather kind of oddly went, went kind of locally viral because uh, uh, they're all filmed. And uh, I think people were so amazed to see a councillor who was so passionate passionate about the issue and um, uh, and so knowledgeable uh, knowledgeable about the issue because we had involved him uh, and and his conservative predecessor when she was before earlier holder we'd, we'd engage them in the process brilliant thank you um so well the, the, there's there's quite a specific uh question here um again sorry for, for you gary um so uh, somebody's just asking about kind of the the number of organizations that were on the system leadership training um mm -hmm. how many staff were involved in and were service users involved in that so over the currency of the alliance i think we've spoken to a thousand service users um uh and hundreds of staff um uh, so we every two years we try to do a thing what we call the big buzz which is where we go back and talk about people, what we've what they asked us to do what we've done and what more do we need to do that 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 kind of thing but we're also constantly doing appreciative inquiry um so f in a different system so i i do some work with some colleagues in parks uh, uh what we call blue and green green space so the, the plymouth parks and the sea and um uh, just between January and the beginning of COVID, we had stopped and spoken to 400 members of the public uh, in the park um, and done very brief appreciative inquiries with them. So, so we're constantly talking to people in the, in, in the system. And when I say people in the system, I always mean everybody, all the staff, all the people that use the system and all the people that manage the system and commission the system. So we don't really make distinctions. We talk to everybody all the time. Great. Um, and we've probably got time for, for one more and I'll, I'll, I'll pick a question that I think kind of applies to uh, Toby and Gary. Um, and that is the, the one about power. Um, so how do you think about and talk about power in the context of human learning systems? Uh, interesting question. Um, so, couple of uh, a couple of immediate responses. That I mean, in some respects, the um, it's really easy for um, a public management approach to be blind to questions of power because um, it's a public management approach, and it's why the this as a, pub, as a different way of doing public management, but it needs to be aligned with and have a, uh, a parallel process of change in how we do politics. Because like, pa power questions are essentially politics questions, right? And so um, the, it's really, one of the challenges is how do you um, change who's, uh, who gets their voice heard? So, uh, from a systems perspective, it's the um, uh, the kind of points that, that Gary makes that you need to actively go looking for the voices that you don't otherwise hear in the system. So that's one of the that's one of the kind of foundational things about um, uh, addressing power inequalities within a kind of public management perspective. And the other thing I would say is that. 
when I was thinking about the, I was thinking the other day, I was trying trying to work out what the relationship between the kind of human learning and the systems bits are, because they're not distinct categories in, of kind of action. And uh, I was thinking that actually the human bit is a claim about moral value. So what does what does this public management approach value and assert is important in the world? It asserts in the, it, that. Uh, the, the variety of human strengths and needs are important. And, and asserting that has significant power implications. Don't know whether that made any sense at all. People vote in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so, for, uh, so for us, the, a lot of the systems work kind of surface the really subtle ways in which some people are perceived to hold power and others don't. Uh, and uh, this applies as much to people that work in the system as, it, as people that kind of experience the system as a customer. Um, and you can't ever, it, workers will always have more power than the pe people they work with. The key thing is that, that they are aware of that, that it's in the open, that it is discussed and spoken about and that uh, we mitigate that where it's possible to mitigate it. But it, it, it's an inevitable consequence of, uh, yeah, the, of, our, of the way services and systems work. Right. I just, um, very cheekily, Chris Bolton, who gave an excellent HLS uh, webinar a couple of weeks ago on, <laughs> on regulation, has asked a question about regulation. So the answer to Chris's question, uh, which is quite niche, uh, is um, we're working on that, uh, Chris, and there are promising signs. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Gary. Um, so I think Toby wants to leave you with um, uh, an invitation uh, for case studies um, and, and future involvement in this conversation. Um, and then once, once Toby's said his bit, um, we'll, we'll close the, the webinar unless, Matthew, uh, we need to finish with anything else. You, you could mention your forthcoming Zoom next month. Oh, I'll mention that again. I'm doing a Zoom next month. <laughs> Um, so there's 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 a link somewhere in the chat but you'll all, oh, you'll all get the link via email as well um so uh i was trying to bring the human learning dot systems website thing up again you can remember it human learning dot systems um the way that we think paradigm shift happens is by creating we've created an alternative paradigm story here an alternative way of thinking about uh, what the task of public management is. What we know about how paradigms shift is you need more and more examples of that paradigm story in practice for people to point at and see themselves in. So partly why on the new website we've um, brought together a whole range of case studies of this type of work in, in action. If there are, so we're, when we're this is issuing a kind of general plea for, um, there we go, thank you. Uh, um, uh, if you're working in this way and would like to feature as a case study on the uh, uh, on the website, there's a little kind of dead simple little form to fill in that says uh, send us some information about it, and some will be someone will be in touch. So uh, please, if you have a, uh, it's on that pioneers page, Matt, on, on the about section. Uh, if you have um, uh, a story that you'd like to share, just go to the bottom of that page and. Uh, um, fill in that little form and someone will be in touch. Thanks very much. Great. Well, thank you all for your time. Um, I'll just repeat, links will follow in an email. Um, the uh, video will be uploaded onto YouTube um, and hopefully see you at the, the next uh, few webinars. Thank you very much. <laughs> see you later, Nick.